My name is Michael Don Smith. And my name is Michael De Groot. And together, we bring you the story of a speech, of speech podcast. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, we, we totally messed that up, but it will do. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Great to be here. Great to be with you, Mike. What, would we, what are we doing? Brilliant. Well, we're, we're launching this brand new podcast, Michael. And, I w- and what do I call you, actually? Michael or Don? No, I'd prefer to call you Michael. I've always called you Michael because my name <laughs> is Michael. So with this brand new podcast that we decided to launch, we want to talk about the story of a speech, brilliant title. Um, and today, this is the introduction. Today is the introduction of this brand new podcast. And we're, we're just testing this out for ourselves and we're testing this on you, the listeners as well. So thank you for joining us. And we're going to start to just so that everybody knows who we are to talk a little bit about ourselves to begin with. So Michael, Don, you're going to go first. So we don't want your life story now. Uh-huh. We, we just want a little bit about why because we started talking about this a while ago and, and you, and I said the podcast, I said audio is the way to go. So let's, let's talk about in a bit how this has all come about, but first of all, about you. Okay. My name, as we said, is Michael Don Smith, because a lot of people in my world call me Don. A lot of people call me Michael. And that comes from how old I am. So in the days before, before the internet, before LED watches, <laughs> in a long time ago, I was in the Royal Air Force. Um, seriously, I would say this is before um, integrated circuits when. Computer equipment was made with resistors and transistors, and you, you dived into this board. So I, I was called Don, and everybody knew me as Don, and that was fine. But then with the advent of the communication explosion, everybody looked things up on computers. So when they looked for Don Smith, they wouldn't find me, because on mm. the computer, my name was Michael Don Smith. So people right. couldn't find me. So I had to say, well, no, you have to look for Michael Don Smith or Michael Smith. They found me. So what's your name? Don or Michael Smith? So I've got the pre-90s world. Everybody I knew then knows me as Don. The post-90s world, some people know me as Don. That's very confusing. So my stage name is Michael Don with a hyphen. Um, background is been communications in the military. And then I was into project management when I developed through the telecoms industry into a consultant and I started teaching more again. I've been taught to the Air Force, I was teaching the industry, taught project management, bumped into a guy called Tony Robbins and in the dot-com era when I was making loads of money with Maggie, I um, decided to take some time off and immerse myself in NLP uh tony robbins stuff personal development jim rose Zig ziglar so on and on and when i came back from my three months sabbatical the world had crashed it was 2008 and my my past job was not very popular so i decided to stay in the world of self-development and personal development and that's why i've got a passion for speaking and presenting and teaching people speaking and presenting which are presenting which i think is the number one business skill and that's where I am. I'm known as the signature speech, and I coach outstanding leaders and remarkable speakers how to develop their number one business skill. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. And in fact, if people want to hear your whole story, they can, of course, listen to an episode on the Share Your Story podcast. Oh, yes. Yes. So they can get the whole background about what happened and and get more detail behind your story which will be which is absolutely fascinating and, and so and a little the, bit about go on so to show you but technology wise is there a link for that is it we're gonna can we provide anything or do we say yes. www dot nah, what do we do 
Well, the, the link to find the podcast will be in the show notes. I'll include that. But otherwise, just go to stayingaliveuk.com forward slash podcast. And uh, they'll just scroll through the episodes. Uh, it's, it's not too far down, but you were quite an early guest on my podcast, which I really appreciate. Lovely. So, so a little bit about me then. Um, I'm a Dutchman. I came to the UK a long time ago, um, traveled to Ireland for a bit, came back to the UK, and I spent like a good part of 30 years in the textiles industry. And I wanted to get out desperately. I had a bit of a kind of awakening in 2004, and that's when I discovered Tony Robbins, actually. And, uh, and my life changed from there. I left permanent employment in 2005, set up my own business, launched it in 2007, totally unrelated to what I do today. I had to reinvent myself um, a number of times. And today, um, finally, I'm doing what I love doing, which is helping people create amazing stories for their business. And I do this through a number of ways, through workshops, storytelling workshops, and also through whiteboard animations and animations to help people articulate the story and present their value proposition to their clients. And that's what I love doing. And of course, I have the Share Your Story podcast as my podcast. And now uh, we're doing the Story of a Speech podcast as well. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So that's us. Um, so now I'd like to kind of delve in, or I think we should delve in to why um, we're doing this. Why, why did we decide? And actually, I'm going to ask you to go first on this one because <laughs> it's, it did start with you, in fairness, because we were just wandering in the middle of Birmingham, just chatting about this. and. Um, I think you've had something brewing in the back of your head about how wh why this will be useful for people. Yeah, I think it, 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 I have to say we both had stuff brewing, and that what, sometimes mm. when I listen to you, um, and I hear what you're doing, it, it triggers things. And I think we were in central Birmingham, and mm. we're talking about stories and storytelling, and. Obviously, you're the storyteller. I'm the speaker trainer. Maybe the speaker. I just like to develop speakers. Mm. And one of the most powerful things any speaker in the business sense of the word, more than the uh, entertaining your children type of things, and we'll most probably do, on this podcast, somewhere along, we'll talk about the types of speeches, types of speakers, because it's one yes. word that has so many iterations. But in the business world, you're idea i believe that so powerful is telling the story of the business people like to the story how did it start who are the characters then again we once we talk about joseph campbell later on the hero's journey which we touched on together and also the idea that if you can tell a story that has a relevance to you and your business it's so much more memorable than giving a bunch of facts or statistics or a brand promise. Mm. And then we realized that the speaking and presenting itself had a story. Or I realized, that, wait a minute, what about the story of how speaking and presenting came? Because here's, here's an idea I'd really like to share and throw out there. Not an idea, a fact. Mm. Before Gutenberg, before... Um, communications developed, and that includes roads and travel and ships and things. The, the wandering troubadour, the minstrel, the traveling storyteller in Africa, the griot, these people were praised and lauded. And in fact, in the Greek era, oratory and the art of rhetoric was at the same level as painting, as sculpture. If you were an orator, you were a, a, a craftsman, you, you perfected your trade, the ability to memorize whole, you know, Il Iliad and Homer. In, in prehistory, these stories were handed down from generation to generation 
as spoken word records. Yes. And with Gutenberg and technology now, because the memory of the human story is now digital, mm. the humans have forgotten their own stories. Mm. However, the snake brain, this Jungian, Jung, Jungian stuff, Jungian philosophy, Jungian, it talks about these archetypes, and the archetypal memory, the tribe memory, the race memory, it's in the DNA. These stories still exist. Mm. And when you tap into the story recognition part, people become captivated. That's why I went to see the movie Endgame, Advent, you know, Avengers, the biggest grossing movie ever, ever Avengers Endgame. Mm. And I sat in the theater with hundreds of other people Mm. mesmerized by the story for three hours. Mm. I didn't see people get up for bathroom breaks. You know, three hours is a long time. It is, yeah. And that's the power of story. It's, it's, it, and I, I, as I said to you, I said, we could do a podcast and it would last forever because we could uncover the story of speech, both modern, historical, ancient, relevant. Because it's such a great story, because the story of speech is the story of the difference between humanity and other mammals. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I, I 100% agree. And the thing is, I don't think, and the other reason is, I don't believe anybody has done it well. There are other podcasts out there. I'm not rubbishing any of them, you know, go and listen to all of them, and there is something missing, I believe, that doing this via audio, um, and, and we'll, we'll have our, our podcast sitting on YouTube as well, but it will just be audio for now. Um, the, the thing is that listening to something like this via audio, it actually is going to be more memorable. Because people, when they watch video nowadays on computers, they are distracted. They'll put it, they'll watch a video, but they won't, you know, you're not sitting in a cinema. You're watching it on a device. You get notifications, you get emails, you get, you get distracted and you don't pick up everything up. So when people are commuting, they're driving in a car right now, people hopefully that are listening to this, they will get a better experience and it will go deeper into them. And that's why I think audio was a really, good way to start sharing the story of a speech. And not only that, businesses need, at the moment, everybody is going down the advertising route, thanks to Google and Facebook. You know, they're, they're oh, and now Amazon as well, because Amazon is kind of, nobody knows this, but Amazon will become probably the biggest advertiser on their site. In the wow. world. Wow. Yeah. They will take they will overtake Google and Facebook because they they're like the number two search engine now, right? Because people okay, might look I'm, at I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause you. I mean, you know I'm terrible with this. But people listening, I just want to tell you something about Michael the group, right? He's about <laughs> two or three cycles ahead of everybody with this digital stuff. So things he's <laughs> told me that are going to happen. Or they're happening, you know, in a nascent beginning form. He knows about it. So another reason to listen to the story of his speech, so he can hear this guy tell you what's going to be happening next before it happens. So that's mm. that's news to me. So Amazon is going to become the only the only regret I have with that. I predicted when fa even before Facebook was known, my friends didn't even know about Facebook, and I, I remember one particular friend. Um, she lives up in Nantwich, and she doesn't mind me calling her out, <laughs> Tracy Ann, and um, or Tian. She's also known as Tian, and she she said, do, "Why do I need to go on Facebook? What's this? What's this all about?" I said, "Just get on it. This is going to be like the biggest platform in the world ever. This is going to be like another Google. Uh, this is going to be a like an internet on its own in its own right." And she went, yeah, okay then. I mean, she's more active on Facebook than I am now today. <laughs> but <laughs> so yeah, Amazon, Amazon Media, basically, I have 
are going to be huge in their advertising because most people will go to Amazon if they need a product. You know, we've got an appetite to buy stuff. And now the default is Google first, but very, very close second probably will become number one to search for products will be Amazon. And I, and I don't know if you heard, but Google's results were down for the first time. Their sales results were down. I don't know the particular reason, but it's an indicator that they're starting to lose a little bit of shine. Now, they've said that about other companies as well, like Apple. But so, so what's happening in the advertising world, um, just coming back to that, businesses believe that that is the default to get people to buy stuff. Now, if it wasn't working, people wouldn't be using advert. So, of course, it's working. But whenever I ask anybody and ask them, do you love the adverts? In a room of, say, 30, 40 people, I get two hands that go up. And they're usually the people that create the adverts. They say they love the adverts. <laughs> when I ask them, do you like going and watching movies in the cinema? All the hands go up. A couple might not. Like Endgame, you know, why do people go and see it? Because it's a story and movies are stories. And that's why I believe that adverts are not necessarily memorable. Stories are memorable because you put yourself in the story. So when I create animations for people, I convince them, persuade them rather to do a story rather than an advert because when people are watching the animation or the movie or whatever, they go, oh, that's me. That's exactly like me. There's that affinity, empathy. That's why this podcast is timely because storytelling in business is becoming a better way to get your, your buyers to buy in to what you do. So, so let me just another thought there. So, we have this term called product placement. Mm. So that's where a company places their products within the story. Yes. <laughs> so the hero uses the Apple computer. Apple are big on this. Every movie, everybody uses Apple. Yes. In James Bond, he's now, he, they compete. Is he driving a BMW? He's driving a, you know, Aston Martin. Aston yeah. Martin. So they know the product place and worse. But what you're suggesting with the story is the business, it's like, it's like a reverse product placement. So you're turning the business into the story. Or by telling the story of the business using power of story, it's almost, wow, I, don't, I, I haven't figured out what I'm saying, but you, is, that, is that triggering a, a sense of rec resonance there? Totally, yeah, totally. because. People relate to stories. They've been listening to stories when they've been knee high, right? In fact, I was talking to a friend who's also a client now, and I was telling him about some storytelling workshops that I'm going to be delivering. And he said, um, oh, I want my daughter to, I want my 12 year old daughter to come along as well. <laughs> as well. <laughs> wow. Because he really wants her to kind of, because she loves stories and he really wants her to understand it. It might not be appropriate at a business well, storytelling but, workshop. No, but, 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 but check this out. That's, that's the point. We're getting there with this. Because that's the point. If you was telling a story, a 12-year-old doesn't understand business. No. They get the story. And then yes. imagine this from a marketing and influence side. Well, it, in fact, it's, 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 we're back to advertising. The, the best adverts a little mini movies, mini stories. Because yes. you can enjoy the story without understanding the meaning. And I'm sure, yes. I know we're going to get into this deep, because in ancient times, nursery rhymes and all these stories were mm. mnemonic devices. So your friend is spot on. If you can get his daughter to understand the story, she might love his company. And if I just digress for a bit more, one of the things happening mm. in West Midlands, where we're based, there are a lot of family old family companies and the yes. children aren't buying into becoming the new owners, managers of the companies. Right. The legacy has been passed on. And maybe that's because the children don't understand 
the story of the company. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ooh. So I keep cutting on to you. So you're going to have to make No, no, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. This is, talk- this, is, this is how we want to run it. This is exactly how we want to run this podcast. And so that's a bit of a flavor of what you can expect. Yeah, yeah. So coming back to um, public speaking then, right? Yeah. Or just speaking in general, because it doesn't necessarily need to be just public speaking. It, it's just speaking using story. Because actually, when I listen to people's conversations, we were some friends out the other night. There were just five of us having dinner together. And the only conversation around the table, when you listen to what people are saying, they are all short stories. Wow. Conversation is just short stories. That's all it is, you know. Yeah. So what they were doing in Cornwall, somebody had gone to Cornwall, somebody had been on holiday to the Lake District, telling the story about what they'd done in the Lake District, the story about Cornwall and the caravan and the weather and everything is just tiny little stories. And the thing is, when they start telling you about it, you transport yourself to the location. You can see Cornwall. You can see the sea. You can see the beach. Um, wow. You know, you can see the Lake District because if you've been there, it's in your head somewhere, isn't it? I, I think I was, don't think I know, I was at one of your um, storytelling workshops and you mm. talked about that. You talked about the fact that when you're in the cinema, you're actually seeing the images of the director and the producer of the movie. But when you're reading a book or when you're listening to a story, you've got the most powerful virtual reality simulation computer creating the images inside your own head. Yes. And I, yes. I'll talk about that because I remember you, you do talk about that in one of your workshops, about how stories release your, your own creativity, your own imagination. Well, in, in our brain, our brain is so powerful, we don't even understand it yet. And it, science has done a lot of work with our, you know, investigating the brain, but truly they don't understand how it, the, the intimate working of it all. But when it comes to storytelling, when you read a book, the book, or even listen to a book now, which I enjoy doing on Audible, but, uh, when you listen or read a book, it's text or it's a voice that you hear. There are, there are no images. It's not a video, right? It's audio or text. There are no pictures in the book either. So why do you keep reading the book, right? The only reason you keep reading the book, if the writer has done their job really well, they will allow you to imagine the picture of it and everybody will get a slightly different picture it's back to saying you know if i say to you everybody has a different image of an airplane nobody has the same image so when you're reading or listening to a book you will get a different image from everybody else can you imagine all those images in people's heads that are reading the same book they're all different millions of different images people are getting in their brain but if the writer has done it a good job, you will get a very strong image in your head, and that keeps you hooked. Because if they describe a particular character, or their facial features, what they're wearing, what they smell like, even smell you can describe, um, and what they smell like, and because if they describe the smell well, you will have smelled that particular smell. Perhaps it's a feeling that you get. You know, so it's back to NLP. Um, you know, the kind of the, the, um, the kinesthetic feeling that you get when you're reading the text or listening to an audio book. Uh, and that's what brings it alive. That brings the story alive. Nothing else brings that story alive apart from you. And then you put yourself in the story. You can empathize with a character and you're rooting for them because you're rooting for yourself. You're imagining that you are that person that is being affected by the journey that they're on and the, the hardships that they're going through. Why? Because 
every single person walking on this planet has a story of hardship and challenges and celebrations. Yeah. So fact, because you, go on, I was just saying, you, no, you, because you, you're, because you're human. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you can relate to it. Uh, and what I was thinking we said is what's happened in the past is I've read a book and people may resonate with this and I've created my version of the character. Mm. How they look, how they see, how they sound. You know, I've, I've built it. I've enjoyed it, and then I'll go and see the movie. Mm. And the movie, oh, oh, it's not quite what I imagined. Right. You know, yes. and, that, and that's one of the things that there is a, a member of the Hollywood team who's called the casting director. Mm. And one of the the things that great casting directors have to do is they have to figure out what mo the most, most, the largest amount of people will recognize because they realize that there's a, there's a James Bond type, there's a uh, Vanity Fair type, there's a type. And the, and the job of the casting director is to find the, the person, the lady, the gentleman, the boy who is the least, the most likely to resonate with the most people with what they read. Because if they get it wrong, People who've read the book or know the story already, they'll, they'll, they'll reject it. Mm. And so it's very, very important that we um, realize that we are creating the worlds that we inhabit when we listen to stories, not the storyteller. The great storyteller is like a, an illusionist, like a, um, a mind reader or mentalist. They paint broad strokes so that you the reader can populate the story with with the things that make it real to you that's what's mm. great about a great story they allow you to become the hero or the heroine in the story and that's what gets you hooked brilliant i love it i love it and then when you let's bring that back now to speaking um because when we we both of us go to networking events and most of the speakers sorry i just <laughs> yeah. the average right they have a powerpoint presentation with 600 slides slight exaggeration <laughs> they're reading from the slides they don't want to look at the audience and it's just very very average and it's not their fault because they are just copying what everybody has done i've always said PowerPoint was the worst invention by Microsoft because it just allowed people to be lazy, not have to think about what they're going to say or rehearse what they're going to say. And they don't use storytelling. They might give a tiny little bit of introduction about who they are, but they don't use storytelling as a powerful medium. And this is where what you're doing with speakers. So tell us a little bit about what are we going to hear from you through this podcast series that will give people some hints and ideas? So what I, what I think, what I know is that stories are what we were, is what speech was created for. Right. Now, what is a story? We have to segue to the hero's journey, which we will come to over and over again in this podcast, I'm sure. Mm, mm. But the idea is that, as Michael said, you know, we, we're all the heroes, the heroines, we're all the star of our own show. Now, the question is, well, there are about three questions. One is, what type of show is it? Because you're the director, the producer, the writer. What type of show? Is it what type of film is it? what type of book? What genre are you? Mm, is it mm. adventure mode? Is it a tragedy? Is it a horror? Is it a sci fi? Because honestly, your beliefs and values determine the genre of your life. And if you don't know you're in control, random and external events develop your story. So, what's the genre? The second one is who are you in the story? I'll tell you the answer is you're the hero, but sometimes the hero is in disguise. 
and we'll go through the story not knowing who the real hero is. And sometimes we'll think the villain is the hero. Sometimes we'll think the mentor is the hero. But until you realize that you are the hero of your story, you may not realize the power you have. Yes. And one of the stories we, should, we have to touch on is the, the pauper and the prince, when the, the pauper sorts place the prince because they're twins, and, we, and we, we examine two different versions of the story. But there are a lot of them trading places with that story. It's where yes. somebody starts to believe they're the king, starts to believe they're the prince, the princess. And that belief transforms their life. So yeah. who are you in your story? What genre is your story? Who are you in that story? Do you recognize you're the hero? And the, second, the last most important part is, what is your quest? What is your adventure? Because if you don't know the adventure you're on, you don't know what to do. So what, what I teach is the idea of a signature speech so that the speech contains you, your signature. So when you start to speak, and this is true already, it's we don't recognize it, you have a way of speaking. You have a way of communicating. We all have a way of being that everybody else recognizes. Yes. I think it was, it might have been Michael. Yes, I was, I was going through your LinkedIn course, which, oh, I, yeah. rec which I recently purchased. Um, Thank you very much. Very good. But, but, but in there, you talk about video and that everybody sees you how you are. So when, when you video people, they go, oh, I don't like the way I look. Can, can I do this? Can that? You say to them, and I like it because you, you, you did a don, as we say in my circles. You went, just get over it. That's what you look like. <laughs> and I thought, see, Michael, you can be like me. I've seen it. Yeah. I've, I've got it. I've, I've got the video. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real Don statement. And it's yeah. true. That's how you look on a video. And yet you worry how you don't have video. Everybody can see you. Do you realize everybody can see you? In the same way, your, your, the DNA of your story comes your accent, your, your mm. mannerisms, the way you speak. Mm. So why not make that? And again, go back to Hollywood. Ray Winston said, your imperfections as an actor are what will make you famous. Right. So Michael Caine's Cockney accent. You know, I only said to blow the bloody doors off. Yes. That's what makes you famous. Sean Connery. Every movie he's got a Scottish accent. You know, he's the, he's the New York subway car. And he's all got, but because it, it's his signature. Yes. It works. So that's what I'll, I'll be looking at. So part of the story of the speech is how people have made their voice integral to their message. And so uh, I love that. I now understand why you call it signature. Oh. Now I get it. Now <laughs> I get it. Finally. So the signature is you. It's, it's you. everything about you. Yeah, perfect. And nobody can plagiarize that because it's got, if you, if somebody turns up and tries to be Michael the group, it doesn't work. Impossible. Because, you know, you're, you're the Einige Echt. You're the real thing. Yes. Huh? Yes. Yes. That was a bit of Dutch he said there, in case you were wondering what the hell that sound was. <laughs> He's the only person I know who actually speaks Dutch to me. <laughs> I don't even understand what you're saying. <laughs> you have to switch you. You have to switch your brain. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so so in this podcast, we you know, there's going to be a bit of training and education isn't there there's going to be some ideas for you to take away with and to to play with um and to think about and to consider when you're next doing your powerpoint 40 slide presentation <laughs> and uh you know just don't do it without one that means they've actually got to look at you yeah. and and listen to you and not kind of stare at a screen like zombies because all you're doing, you're turning them into zombies anyway. Well, you can well, have a few slides, but... Just a quick, there's a quick one on that. Um, I, I got a, one of my most important clients I won because they were presenting using PowerPoint. He was doing stories. He had great speech. The guy was a brilliant presenter. He was quite a mm. senior gentleman. And uh, yes. 
he kept walking in front of the PowerPoint because he was so, so, so good pe speaker. He wanted to be front of the stage. I tell everyone, you're the stage. And the PowerPoint was shining in his face. And, oh, I, and yeah. I, I saw him, I said to him afterwards, do you know that if you press B on your keyboard, and I think we've shown this works with Max as well, with, um, if you press B, the screen goes blank. Right. And you press B and it comes back. So that's a little tip you can take away that if you are presenting and you want to just stop the screen so you can talk to your audience, always a mm. good thing directly, mm. just mm. press B and the screen goes back. You don't lose your place. Nothing towards happens. When you're ready, press B again to bring it back. Back to you, Michael. No, that's a great tip because those are the kind of things you're not taught, are you? No one tells you that. In fact, no one gives you that feedback. I was listening to, I don't know if you've seen Brene Brown or listened to any of her yeah, TED Talks. Oh, yes. The vulnerability. The vulnerability. <laughs> yeah. yeah the power. And she's got a Netflix thing, documentary. Well, actually, she's talking to an audience. And I was listening to a podcast yesterday, and she was on the, uh, I listened to a podcast called 10% Happier. Um, and, and, she was talking about this whole vulnerability thing and she was talking about feedback, you know, giving vulnerable feedback to people and being in a place where you can be vulnerable with somebody to give constructive feedback. And so I think... That, so let me just, just so the listeners can understand what you're saying, because I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying. So I think it's, it's being, it's receiving feedback in a vulnerable state. Is that what you're saying? Or giving no, no, no. I, no, she said it the other way around. Ah. So I tell you what it is. Most people don't want to give feedback because they don't want to give. You're good at this. <laughs> but I know. They, they don't <laughs> want to give people bad news, right? Yeah. So. Um, they dress it up, call it a love sandwich, you know, yeah, what's yeah. good about you, where you need to improve, and then what's good about you so you feel better about yourself. And I think you say, don't mess around with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> the I, feedback. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to, hear, sorry to quote, I wanted to hear what you said because, as I said, you did it in your, so I've got evidence of you doing this because you did it in your, but yeah, I think people, even when they're listening to you, I was being naughty there, People will translate what you say to what they want to hear. So yes. people listening to this podcast, hearing you saying, give vulnerable feedback, they would, mm. they would translate to, oh, he means receive vulnerable feedback. But what happens when you give real hard, and I use that word correctly, feedback, you are now at risk of the backlash. Yes. And that's why yes. people don't want to do it. It's not, because, it's not because they want to be kind to the person they're giving the feedback to. They don't want to get the hassle of that person saying, oh, you're sucking me down. You're doing me in. You, you're over yes. for. Yes. Yes. You got it. Yeah, absolutely. And it still means it's got to be given, you know, sensitively. Yeah. And the other thing is people, people are scared of receiving feedback as well, right? Yeah. Rather than kind of going, well, just, you know, just tell me how it is. I want to know the truth because if you're not telling me the truth, how can I improve? And they were talking about this whole thing around 360 degree feedback that there's now the fashion in companies where it's anonymous and a company comes in and they interview these people for an hour. And actually this was this guy, the host for 10% Happier, Dan Harris. He's an American kind of anchor guy on, on CBS and um, he had a breakdown about 10 years ago and he got into meditation and now he's, you know, he still has issues, but he, he had this about nine months ago, he had this 360 degree feedback and it crushed him because he just had it on paper. It just came to him on paper and he had to read some horrific truths about himself and he really struggled with it, right? So there's another, so he is like, by well, next year, when it's 360 degrees, <laughs> going to go, I don't want that. <laughs> you know? um, but coming back to speaking, and let's say you're in, in one of your, your training courses and you're 
practicing in front of your group, which is a safe environment, you're also petrified of getting feedback, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. And some verbal feedback. And then people will hold back. They'll kind of go, well, actually, I didn't quite say what I really wanted to say about what you said because I want to be kind to you. You know, I want you still to be my friend. Yeah. But actually, you're not helping them. It's, it's very true. Um, we, we do this. What, what I like what you said there is, well, though, that with, with the breakdown comes a breakthrough. If you survive the breakdown, you have mm. to recalibrate your, your sense of the world. But if we can do this in smaller chunks, and the, I mean, the, the, the time you can save, and, I, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not a paid therapist, although I do pretend to be one in my horses. <laughs> I'm not a part of my therapist. But the speed, if we're talking about Richard Bandler, to just to drop a name, that he, and he helped to create stuff like Breathe Therapy with Carl Rogers, these 50 million things. And it's this idea that we can spend 10 years in therapy reliving the tragedy that traumatizes yeah. us and yeah. getting nowhere, or we can face the fear and get over it. Now, this is a delicate subject, and I don't, I'm not, don't want to treat it lightly. When it comes no. to speaking, the vogue, the big thing is to give people confidence to stand on the stage, which is a good thing. If people are not speaking, they're not going for it because they don't have confidence. You can go and you guess one can build up your confidence. But very often they leave it there. So people are now confident on stage. They can get up and speak and they feel good because they overcome their fears. But they're crap at actually speaking. <laughs> so <laughs> their competence hasn't been developed. Because every time they speak, people go, wow, you're so brave. You know, you were so good to get on stage. You're marvelous. You're wonderful. And they're hearing you're a great speaker. Yes. But that's not what's being said. What's being said is, I'm scared of going on the stage. You went on the stage, so you're good. Because yes. you know, I couldn't do that. I and mean, you're better than me. But what I think, and that's what this podcast is about, it's about the story of a speech, the, the history the legacy, the uses of it, how to get better at it. It's the whole story of the speech itself. So every time you get in front of an audience of one or a thousand, you should be looking for, it's an opportunity to increase your competence to get better at delivering your story and telling your story. I yeah. think that's what we're, we're about. There is this, this, this four stages, isn't there? Let's see if I can get them right. There's this, because I love the word competence. So <laughs> got this, what is it? Unconscious incompetence <laughs> that then moves to conscious incompetence that then moves to co uh, conscious competence. And the last one is subconscious competence. No? Oh, yeah, yes, subconscious or unconscious. Or unconscious, yeah. unconscious competence. Yeah. yeah. I thought there was only three stages, and then I realized the other day, oh, no, there's four stages. Well, there's, that... fi there's five. Oh, go on. So you, you have, and, the, and I, was, I, I, made it, I made the fifth one myself, but you know what I'm like. So, so yeah. unconscious incompetence is the baby. The baby doesn't know that they don't know how to speak. Yes. Or drive a car or fly a plane. <laughs> I don't know. I just got an image of a baby flying a plane. <laughs> yes, oh. but they don't know. This is the unconscious incompetent. Then, oh, you've just given me an idea for a cartoon. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the things that Michael does is the uh, <laughs> visual storytelling, turning words into pictures, which tells people to tell stories, which we're getting will cover. We have so much to do on this podcast. Oh, my God, so loads. Yeah. Then somebody tells you that you don't know how to fly a plane or you don't know how to drive a car or you see somebody doing something. You say, wow, no, that could be done. Mm. And that, that is a brilliant moment. That's the moment of possibility. It's so powerful. So conscious incompetence is not a bad thing. It's brilliant. Oh, my gosh. You mean I can do that? That is possible? Wow, I'm going to go away and learn that. Yes. So you go away and learn it and 
driving the car is the classic example. You, you get lessons and you learn to drive. The, 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 the P, they've got a P sign down there. They've got P on the back of cars, which means past. I don't know what that meant. You know, so what, 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 I know L's for learning. What's this P thing? I thought it was provisional. No, P is for people who've passed. Oh well, somebody God. tell us, check. I don't know, you see. But I think P means they're passed. Right. They pass their test. Oh, brilliant. Because the, we'll have to check. Next time you see a car with a P on the back, see if there's two people in it. If there's two people, <laughs> then it means provisional. If there's only one person, it means passed. Okay. But that's <laughs> unconscious. Sorry, that's conscious incompetence. So they say when you pass your driving test, that's when you start to learn to drive. Yes. It's because you're on your own and you're learning. And then over time, you still don't think about the clutch and the gear and that. You, just, mm -hmm. you, you can leave A and get to point B and you don't know how the hell you got there. That's right. And that's when you've moved from conscious competence to unconscious competence. Yes. But there's a fifth stage. Right. And nobody in the world has heard this until no. they hear this podcast. Yeah. The fifth stage is super conscious competence. Wow. And that is when you can disassociate from yourself. You, 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 so so you, you, this is where the master, the Messies, the Bruce Lees, the masters, what they do is they're a master of the thing, but then they disassociate. They can watch themselves performing at the highest level, and then they can respond and react at an almost – superhuman level so when uh, when roger federer returns a ball that we know is too fast it's moving too fast for the human senses to comprehend and yet they return it mm. um uh, any superb swim athlete you know people say then they chick sick me high it calls it flow the flow state when you enter mm. flow so when mm. you're driving it when you're when Lewis Hamilton is driving his car, he's operating at a level of response and reaction that is superhuman. Mm. So he's, he can drive a car unconsciously competent because he's not do it. But now he's operating at the next level where he's mm. able to react out of time, instinctively, yes. preternaturally. Yeah. So what we're looking for is the guru level, is super conscious competence. When you can observe yourself operating at the highest level of your capability and tweak it. Wow. I love it. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> it almost sounds unattainable when you say it in that way. Yeah. It's almost scary as well. It's like, wow, I mean, I'll be, I'll be happy when I get to subconscious competence. <laughs> 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 Super conscious competence, my God. Uh, but it's interesting because I'm, I'm kind of relating it to podcasting, right? Okay. So, so, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I started doing my podcasting and I had, I had no knowledge about podcasting. I didn't even know how to publish a podcast. I didn't even know where to begin. I didn't even know what the equipment I needed. So I immersed myself. I just was lucky to find a, like, you know, email series that you sign up for that has, like, a number of videos and it's free. But if you don't watch the video on the day that it comes out, the next day it's gone and you can't watch it again. It's like, and at the end of it, you can buy all the videos and it's a really great marketing ploy. But it's one of the top podcasters in the world in America. I forget his name temporarily. <laughs> Um, I'll put a link in the show notes when I remember. It's it's E on Fire. Um, anyway, it's it's yeah, it's called E on Fire or something. And um, but I got some really great tips and ideas, and I created my own process for it. And then I had to start interviewing people, which I'd never done before either. So I I found friends that knew me, and they were happy to chat to me. You know, so. I kind of practiced on them. And as we went, as I went along, I'm on like episode 70 at the moment. And, but by the 70th episode, I know what I'm doing. You know, it's, I don't have to think about it. It's quite natural. I know what's happening. And, you know, there is a system, there's a process, there's a process for 
and I'm really, really quick at producing the podcast as well. So people kind of go, oh, when do you think it might go out? I said, well, today. They went, what, today? I said, yeah, I don't hang around. I just produce it. And within a couple of hours, it's out there. And, um, but that's exactly what you're talking about. When you practice something over and over and over, you will get better at it and you will do it at a level where it may not be super conscious competence, <laughs> but be at a competence level where you don't really need to think about it again. Well, here, if we stay on this thread, the problem with subconscious or unconscious competence is it's dangerous. True. Because it doesn't evolve. It stays. It stays because you've learned how to drive the car that way in that environment, and it's wired into your neurology. Well, we know mm. that the world changes. Yes. And the example, there are lots of examples where organizations have not evolved. IBM was subconsciously competent at selling computers. But then mm. the computer marketplace with Microsoft and Dell changed. If they don't evolve, but the problem is with unconscious competence, you have to wait for the event to come and shatter your abilities oh, before you God. burn. But yes. if you're able to disassociate and detach and see yourself in the environment performing, not because when you're in it, water to a fish, air to a bird, and a man to himself, these are mysteries. If you're swimming in the water, you don't see the water. You fly in the air, you forget you need the air. But if you can dissociate and you see yourself and the context and the environment, you can actually adjust before you need to. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the business, people who study business, Tom Peters talks about the S curve. And he says, you, and other, he says, kill your business before your competition does. Yes. So at your most successful point, that's when your business is the most vulnerable. Because complacency sets in. Mm. So I don't know how we got there, but I'm I'm watching the time, and we've done we've done lots of stuff. I think we we need to gonna, just think about. Um, no, we're going to end it. We're going to end it on that final note. <laughs> like you just said, I think that's a perfect place to leave people considering that. Wow. And we can expand on it further as we go through the episodes, but. Yeah, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for helping us <laughs> with this introduction. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's fun. And we'll, we'll get more competent as the weeks go on. We will, we will. But for now, it's good my, goodbye even <laughs> from Michael De Groot. And it's goodbye from Michael Don Smith. Bye goodbye. for now. <laughs>